professionals. Here we are with another news roundup. Um, I want to wish you a happy belated International Women's Day, though I feel like it's International Women's Day every day. All equal. We're all amazing. Um, but I hope you celebrate it. So anyways, as you know, I'm here with Lalo and Andy. Hi. Good morning. Good morning to you. You know, this show is here to uh, bring you some updates. And uh, recently I thought about something. So to stay compliant is to also stay updated with whatever is happening around your industry. That's the only way you can stay compliant. So while I'm thinking that, I really hope that this podcast gives you um, some you know, input in the news and makes you think and, you know, makes you go back into your in or into your company and say, you know, this is what's going on. How is it affecting us? So that's all I wanted to just kind of bring to attention because uh, I really thought about that as I was writing a newsletter. And anyways, yeah, so let's get back into the articles. Um, our first article is talking about the EU um, taking a stand on um, forced labor. So forced labor, obviously, we've been talking about it for so long, but the European Union Parliament and Council have reached a provisional agreement to ban products made with forced labor leading the way in the global fight against labor exploitation. So this ban will applies to goods made abroad with forced labor, obviously, as well as products manufactured within the U.S. using components produced under forced labor conditions. So anything that's involved with forced labor, as should, um, would be banned if approved. So what do we think about this? Is this like, obviously, this is a forward move, but is this something that every country has kind of started like, this is the EU, but how is the United States? Is, are, they, are we doing the same in the United States? Um, are we doing the same in other countries? Or what's the baseline right now to this? Well, we definitely, I mean, the U.S. has uh, been leading the way, I think, on this particular issue. Uh, there's This has been, you know, the issue of dealing with forced labor has been a topic that's been discussed for decades. Uh, it has only been in probably in the last five years that there has been uh, legislation and regulation that have had teeth in this. And so as such, uh, I mean, basically in the U S um, if there's something that comes in, you have to prove that that item was manufactured without forced labor versus just taking a statement and saying, you know, you know, it, you've got to prove it before it comes in. And same thing here in the, in with the EU uh, article, they basically are banning commodities that were manufactured with forced labor. And it's going to be putting even more pressure on China. China's economy actually, you know, people wonder, is this really having an effect? It really is. China's economy domestically is uh is it's hurting because of these regulations and more and more of this kind of stuff is going on we've got another article we'll talk about and, and, and it's coming into play with this but good for europe uh in in they're just basically you know the EU, eu parliament now that's the european union parliament has finally gotten together as a whole uh group of uh, countries and uh put the foot down on this yeah important saw that um what i was reading and and i did a little more research i guess after after we um after you gave us the the articles on it was that um i was kind of curious why this article came out i mean i, I mean it, it wasn't 100 percent clear if they are talking about um just now enforcing this or are they stepping it up it turns out that it's actually stepping it up when i read the article again at, at first i didn't really pick this up but it's actually talking about e uh, about forced labor um and it's not pinpointing china or anything it's it's anybody and everything so not only are they banning products imported into the eu they're also banning products exported out of the eu meaning that they are targeting um forced labor practices within the eu like if 
it's always been said and it's always been kind of like this weird thing like here in the US <laughs> I mean I hate to say this but here in the US they there's always been that argument that um in uh, in prisons some they, they there are some not are there is like forced labor <laughs> honestly speaking it is forced labor um because uh, prisoners are forced to do labor be it um light manufacturing or or um uh cleanup you know or whatever it is that they may be doing i mean that that could be considered forced labor i mean i know they're prisoners etc i'm not going to fight or or get into that but i i think that's what eu is targeting you know there may be situations where that is going on in the eu and uh, people look the other way maybe or or didn't really consider that forced labor or whatever the case may be but now they're targeting that now they're saying even if it was made in the eu doesn't mean it was not forced labor and if they find that it is they're just banning you from exporting that as well so it's not only incoming but also outcoming outgoing so so um i just felt that i thought it was strange that i didn't pick up on that at first that that it was not um talking about how the eu was already enforcing it but they are they they have been enforcing it all along they're just def, they're 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 increasing it dramatically i guess yeah so anyway mm -hmm. i mean i know china is the primary you know forced labor source i guess but I think, yeah, it's important to look at anywhere. And you, you did say uh, uh, the thing with the prison. I've heard that a couple of times. It's just crazy because we don't think that's so bad to say, but like right away when we mentioned forced labor, we don't think about that. We think about China, you know? Um, and China uses, you know, work camps and, and things of that nature uh, uh, in their factories and whatnot. But, but, Prisoner, well, that's what a work camp is, a prisoner work camp. But it's, you know, it, prisons here in the U.S. or around the world, if there is a product that's manufactured, that is categorized as forced labor. Uh, the question comes into play, what are they paid and, and whatnot, but still. All I'd say, um, it's just uh, one of these things for international uh, trade uh the 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 issue of supporting uh forced labor uh is it comes in to, to bear and and you go from there so yeah anyways um i i it, that's a good thing in the trade industry obviously because we let, let me out. you had, let, let me jump in real quick you had a question that you sent us ahead of time what can companies do yes i wanted to ask that question actually what can yeah. they do to come Comply, comply with this. Yeah, to ensure compliance. Yeah. Well, and that's that's one of the things we've been talking about for probably the last year. You've got to go and investigate um, your supply chain and your your tier one, tier two, tier three. That means your first level uh, main contacts, their next level, and the third level. You've got to actually see those products that if you're buying them. Where are they getting the raw goods? Where are they, uh, what are they doing? How are they doing? You, you've got to get boots on the ground, go see this stuff. Or people a lot of times say, well, you know, it costs too much money to travel, whatever. Uh, you would be better off to then change sources that you can do that with or go get boots on the ground, get somebody over there, get a company to go over there and look at it. But you've got to verify in today's world whether it's U.S., Europe, Canada, Mexico regulations, all of that, Australia, New Zealand has the same thing. You've got to verify your supply chain. So it's just the fact of life in today's world. Yes, food for thought. Okay, second article, moving on. We have um, mentioning China again. Here we go. From China to Canada, critical metals market um, – so there's some stuff happening, which it, it's a little bit tricky for me to understand anything in that industry. But ultimately, Canada's Energy and Natural Resources Minister has expressed concerns about market manipulation and dumping practices in the critical metals industry as China controls over 90 percent of the global supply. Um, so basically, Canada is exploring alternate 
alternative pricing models and seeking to attract capital for mining operations. So let's talk about it more um, because also that that's something I'm not fully um, like understanding or comprehending, I guess. Why do you want to take a shot first? I jumped in on the last one. Right no, um, well, all I saw was that um, the the, the um, this is based on uh, Canada's vision or view on on the metals that are that that the world and and starting with them are relying so much on China, and they just feel that there's a lot of anti. I mean, there's a lot of dumping going on, um, meaning that the huh. Is it is that anti dumping? Oh yeah, right. Well, well, yeah, they're they're, they're, they're trying to com- they're, dumping, yeah. they're trying to combat dumpings, which is what they call anti dumping. So anyway, but yeah, so what's happening is that um, they just feel that uh, a lot of the the mining and metals and et cetera that are coming from China are being subsidized by the government, and therefore when it's coming into Canada in this case, because it is a Canadian story, um, it is coming in at a much, much lower price than it could even possibly be mined in, in locally, you know, or regionally, you know, in the country. So what they're doing is that they're trying to get together with other countries like the U S and Australia and, um, not just those, but others, um, to try and figure out how they can rely or or pick up on um, on minerals and and uh, in other regions to be able to to not have to rely on China's uh, resources for that. So, so like that's what, uh-huh. what can they do to ensure fair pricing or prevent like market manipulation that way? Like well, even though it is much cheaper, can't they? Well, that's what they're doing. That's yeah, that's why they have anti-dumping state. laws and rules, right? Right. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So then, what so here, here's the thing, uh, Anik. I mean, you're asking a good question. This is something that most people don't really understand. Yeah, not because they're ignorant. You know, they, it, it's just something you don't deal with it as much. It, it's it's a scenario here where China uh, is is taking raw materials and manufacturing batteries and things of that nature. So with those types of raw materials that are mined around the world and sent to China to manufacture, let's say, the the uh, EV batteries and, and other items, then China turns around and are selling those products into Canada in this case. They are selling those products at a price lower than what they sell them for in their own country. All right, that's dumping. And the question then would be, why are they doing that? They're trying to make sure that other countries do not set up companies and have, so it's, it's an, it's to, so they can supply everyone. Exactly. That's the idea. So what Canada is doing to counteract that is putting, uh, looking at assessing anti dumping duties on it. So you have, let's just say that for the, you know, the product comes in, it may be duty free or maybe let's say there's 3% duty. Okay. Fine. But then they'll put anti dumping duties on it. And in that would then elevate the cost to import that in, which would make it then comparable to, you know, uh, other domestic uh, companies. So all that to say is that that's how they're, they're dealing with it. And, and the one thing that kind of surprised me, I looked in uh, and uh, the top 10 mines in the, in the world that mine lithium. And that's what we're getting at here is in this article is uh, there's lithium nickel oxide. And with uh, the top 10 uh, mines, the number one, mine in the world is from Mexico. That's it is surprised me. I thought it was all in Africa. Actually, of the top ten mines, number ten was in Africa. The number one is in Mexico. Number two is in Nevada. Uh and then there's several in Canada and in Australia. Uh I was just, you know, again shocked on that. So they mine the the raw ore and then it's sent to China to manufacture these EVs. And, of course, you can look at other plants around the world that's going to be looking at it. But when China then sends it back 
there are other factories that are manufacturing, you know, car batteries and all that. Uh, and what China's trying to do is sell their product lower so that it makes them more competitive, if you will. Yeah. And I get it, but like, what, why can't we just, obviously it makes sense for Canada to do that. That's obvi- obviously because they need, China's their not country. playing fair though. They, it needs to be fair. But I feel like it's so much better because then, you know, we all pay less and we can all make money. Like, it's just, why can't we just be nice? <laughs> Anyways, the third one, um, which we're going back to forced labor. It was hot this week. So that's why we're talking about it once more. Um, this time, China is involved again. I'm so sorry to buggy with that one. But it's a pretty interesting one. Crazy, actually. So a China silicon producer has filed a complaint with the U.S. Court of International Trade challenging the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, CBP, um, and their decision to issue a withhold release order. They call it WRO against them for alleged, alleged, whatever you call it, forced labor practices. Um So basically, he argues that CBP's inclusion of their company within the WRO, which is the withhold release order, lacks support and legal basis, emphasizing their operations outside of Xinjiang and commitment to ethical sourcing practices. So basically, that's what's happening. Um, Pretty crazy because they're trying to even justify their actions, which I feel like is, they're a bit delusional. Um, Do you guys have any remarks on the case overall anyways? On if, is it justified for them to do that? Or do you, obviously they're going to defend themselves, but what do you think about this one? Well, they're trying to defend themselves. All right. So what's, what's happened here is that, the company, uh, Jai Zing Hushan, who, which is, uh, and forgive me if I've mispronounced it, but it's Thanks the manufacturer of silicon to metals. Name. And yeah, and it's, yeah, well, the, it's the company named Jai Zing, uh, Hoshan. And, and with that, it's, uh, they manufacture what's called silicon metal and that is used in solar panels. So, the, the, the challenge here and that their factories, uh, are used in that Northwest quadrant of China where they're using forced labor. And what happened is over, I think it was in 2021, um, uh, customs, uh, filed a complaint against them and, and listed them as a company that's used in forced labor. So it's their goods have been banned from being imported or seized and, and all that kind of stuff. This company is trying to fight back, saying that customs has not provided adequate evidence to show that and that they're trying to show that uh, one of their 10 supply chains, I believe, is that where the article is not even touching uh, uh, forced labor versus the others. And they're and customs is looking at, look, it's an all or nothing. You've got to you got to divest yourself of forced labor all across the board. So what's happening again is that we're trying to make this push for green energy, the largest supplier of solar panels around uh, anywhere is China, and this is one of those companies, and they're using forced labor in it. So there's quite a dichotomy here. But uh, bottom line, they have their products have been uh, seized or, or prevented from being uh, imported, and uh, Jai Zing uh, company is is uh, filing a petition in the U.S. Court of International Trade uh, to push back, and they're trying to get exemptions. Thus far, Customs has said no; they're not going to give an exemption, and uh, so that's where they're where we're at with this. And so far, it seems to be pretty valid. And I think the problem is that they're saying that customs has no evidence and uh, why are they withholding uh, product, et cetera. Um, but the fact of the, 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 the matter, I mean, the fact is that um, the way the Uyghur forced labor, UFLIPA was, was written, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act was written, 
the burden lies on the importer and not the not U.S. Customs. In other words, U.S. Customs, if anything comes from the Xinjiang region, it's going to be detained it, it automatically. It's automatically assumed forced labor. And that's the way the law was written. And that's the way it, it, it the, unfortunately for them, they, they are saying, wait, you have no proof, but that's not the way it is. It's, it's, um, you know, the rebuttable presumption, meaning that you need to rebut my presumption that it was <laughs> manufactured with forced labor, you know, so, so it's, so the far other, they haven't it, done that either. Right. And, and they haven't done it. So, so. In other words, they, they um, I feel they're going to lose this case, you know, only because it's been written that way, you know. And so um, it's just something for any importer to be aware of. You know, that's probably the biggest key takeaway here is that even though you know or you strongly feel that your product was not manufactured using forced labor, but if it came from that region, it, it, it's it's going to be detained. You know, that's just the default, you know? And so because of that, I mean, it's just something that get all your paperwork ready, I suppose, you know, and all your proof and evidence and uh, um, just, just be aware that that's going to happen because you, you do need to prove it's almost like um, you're guilty into proven innocent instead of the other way around. It's uh, exactly where I was going to go is that in this particular case, uh, it's presumed uh, that you're, in a sense, guilty. You have to prove that your goods were not manufactured with forced labor to ha uh, have them allowed in. And, and thus far as this country, a company has not provided that evidence. And uh, therefore, they're saying, yeah, they're trying to twist it around our customs, but they themselves have not done the due diligence to show what they, you know, uh, that the goods are, are manufactured sufficiently. So it's in the U.S. Court of uh, International Trade right now. And as they're arguing the, the points, uh, I think to your point, Lalo, I don't think they're going to win this case. And uh, it'll go from there. And, you know, Taken with the previous article, solar panels going into Europe, if they come from this particular company, uh, Jai Zing uh, Hoshan, uh, are going to have a problem going into Europe. I also think that China's not making an effort like at all to give any information on what is happening with forced labor or the allegations. We've talked about this on the, in the beginning or like a while back um, when you said that China is not trying to cooperate. They think nothing is wrong. And so they're not even trying to bring any evidence that they're not having it. So I don't understand how he thinks that um, or they think they're just going to get away with it. Blaming well, and this is one thing is they they've tried to leverage. And it's a good point, but they're trying to leverage their huge if you will, supply, uh, you know, being the uh, huge source of so many different products over time. What's happening is little by little countries around the world are pushing back on them and it's having an effect on China. It's, it's having a big effect on China's economy. Uh, but the other thing there is it gives the opportunity to say, you need to find other sources. And, uh, you know, India is another source of the solar panels, I believe, and maybe some others around. But, uh, you know, again, you have to look at your your quality and and uh, whatnot. But uh, the geopolitical tensions with China alone is, is just a difficult thing. Yeah. And with that being said, um, we're concluding this, I guess. Uh, lots of forced labor, lots of China, you know. Um, can't do anything about it. I don't choose what's happening in the world. I wish I did. Uh, but I do have an interesting fact for you guys, or fun fact, um, and it is pertaining International Women's Day. I know it's already passed, but I think it's something good to bring up at the dinner table. So on, do you guys know when first inter when the first International Women's Day was held? Like around? Or like, no? Okay. Well, it's very, so in Austria, Denmark, Germany, and Switzerland, um, the first International Women's Day was held in 1911. Now, <laughs> 60 years after, about, 
1975 is when the United Nations recognized it. So um, obviously it's a younger country, but crazy to think about that. It's been so long and uh, there's uh, still a few issues in this world that we, you know, um, women have to face, I would say. But I mean, mostly it's good. I think there's a l loads of strong women, especially in the trade industry. I've met so many people and we've had so many on the podcast. Um, we also have so many trade experts at Global Training Center women uh, who are so amazing and, you know, role models to so many in the industry. And I just hope to continue it that way and to have many more women join trade and for them to have a community that, you know, they don't feel threatened or um, any kind of way. Anyways, that is the last thing for today on the agenda. I think it was a great episode. I learned a few things. I hope you did too. Um, if you're dealing with any companies, if you're dealing with, you know, sketchy forced labor, look into it. I mean, probably if you're listening to this, I hope you're not dealing with forced labor. I really don't. <laughs> but before I get myself in a rut here, I'm just going to say bye. And I hope you have a great week. Thank you very much for joining us. Simply Trade is brought to you by the generous contributions of Global Training Center. You can follow the show and GTC on LinkedIn or Twitter and other social networks. Make sure you check out the show notes in the description for a full rundown of today's show with all the important links. Also, make sure that you share this with a friend and subscribe on your favorite streaming platform. We really like hearing from you. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to rate and review wherever you listen to this podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the show or would like to sponsor Simply Trade or suggest any topic you would like for us to discuss, please contact us via email at simplytrade at globaltrainingcenter.com or you can DM us on Twitter at simplytradepod. Thank you again for the privilege of your time. Happy trading. Simply Trade is not a law firm or an advisor. The topics and discussions conducted by Simply Trade hosts and guests should not be considered and is not intended to substitute legal advice. You should seek appropriate counsel for your own situations. These conversations and information are directed towards listeners in the United States for informational, educational, entertainment purposes only and should not be substituted for legal advice. No listener or viewer of this podcast should act or refrain from acting on the basis of information on this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel. Information on this podcast may not be up to date depending on the time of publishing and the time of viewership. The content of this posting is provided as is. No representations are made that the content is error free. The views expressed in or through this podcast are those of the individual speakers, not those of their respective employers or Global Training Center as a whole. All liability with respect to actions taken or not taken based on the contents of this podcast are hereby expressly disclaimed.